Bob. What's that, Linda? No, I was just saying, uh, telling Bob to tell his his lady hi for me. I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. We are in the book of Malachi tonight. Um, and um, who was Malachi? The priest. Okay, the word means my messenger. Um, some people think he was uh, a priest. Some people think he was Levitical. Uh, the word Malachi or the name means my messenger. We don't even know for sure that it's a proper name. Um, we don't know of other Malachi's in the Bible. In chapter 3, verse 1, the same term is used for somebody else other than um, the, the prophet, uh, a messenger that God is going to send. We'll look at that when we get there. Uh, so there, there's some debate among scholars whether this prophet's name is actually Malachi or whether he's just a messenger from God. Actually, the uh, uh, the, the general consensus among Jews, apparently, is that Ezra wrote Malachi. Um, I think largely because of the um, uh, similar concerns with uh, marriage to foreign women and, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, some Christians, Jerome, for instance, uh, felt that uh, uh, Malachi was written by Ezra. Um, if that's the case, then he wrote around 450 BC during the reign of Artaxerxes I. If he's not Ezra, we don't know for sure, but you can sort of piece together some things as we'll probably do. Uh, we, we don't really know much about this prophet, obviously. Uh, there are even some who uh, look at uh, similarities in wording in Zechariah 9.1, Zechariah 12.1, and Malachi 1.1 and come to the conclusion that uh, those are actually three anonymous prophets that end in the collection of uh, uh, that, that Zechariah ends after chapter eight, and that we have after that three anonymous prophets that end this collection of prophets in the uh, Old Testament. Um, I suppose that's possible, but I, I it's yeah, who knows. But uh, but in any case, we don't know a lot about. This man that uh, we 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 think of as Malachi and know as Malachi, uh, other than what he wrote here, and so that's what we're going to spend the bulk of our time on what he what he actually had to say to uh, So um, you can turn to Malachi chapter one. That's where we will begin. Okay. Now maybe somebody would read uh, one through five one through five for us. Burden the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, In what way have you loved us? Was not Jacob the Lord, says the Lord, yet Jacob have I loved, but Esau have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, We have been impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I will throw down. They will be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. So, um, Malachi is kind of unique in that uh, the, the way he presents prophecy is sort of sort of question and answer kind of kind of uh, presentation, rhetorical questions more or less. Um, and and what's the first one that he that he uses in our reading? What's the first rhetorical question? What have you loved? How have you loved us? God has has said to Israel, I, I, I love you, I have loved you, and, and you ask, how have I loved us? Now, this is not, uh, they're asking for information, right? This is, uh, 
They're saying they're in exile, so obviously you don't love us. Yeah, it, it, just exactly how would you say that you love us, God, based on what has happened to us? Just exactly, you know, how, how would you call this love, right? Um, they're saying it's sarcastic. Yes, yes. But obviously they've missed all of the redemption language that we've looked at week after week. They've and missed the it on, haven't they? So now it kind of seems... They've missed it. And, and that's what he says, right? He, he says, okay, you, you don't think I love you? Look at your brother Esau, right? Uh, Esau, of course, Jacob's brother, and, and, and in that sense, just as much the line of Abraham and Isaac as Jacob was. Uh, and yet, Jacob have Israel have a love, Esau have a hate. Does God hate Esau? Has God, did God hate Esau? Well, but he gave up his birthright. Okay, gave up. It's it's a it's a it's a figure of speech. It's a Semitic way of of of, of speaking uh, that that basically uses these two extremes to make a point about God's care for Israel. Right? It's not so much that God hates Esau. It's that God has not. Uh, preserved her through a covenant the way he has Israel. And, and so you know, he's, he's reminding Israel of the way he has always been their God. He's always been present. He's always kept that covenant and, and, and remained true to his people, even when they haven't been true to him. Uh, so I may say, we've been crushed, we'll rebuild. And God says, yeah, and I'll keep demolishing because... because Jacob had a love. Esau had a hate. Now, what did Esau do? Well, it's not really about what Esau did or didn't do, though we've seen some, some reprehensible things that Esau did, but Israel's done reprehensible things too, right? Uh, this is about God's covenant relationship with his people. Is this an actual question that somebody might have asked? Because uh, if it is an actual question, it shows... An incredible lack of uh, self awareness on the part of the uh, on the part of Israel that they don't understand why these things have happened to them. Oh, how have you loved it? You know, you, you let us go and, and all the well, you, you think that they would know. Yeah. Yeah. why those things happened to them. And it, it wasn't because God loved them. It was through their own sin and, and ignoring the, of, of the law. But it's a very human thing, isn't it? That when, when my life goes off the rails, well, God hates me. I, I mean, I've had people ask me, why does God hate me? Because their life has gone, you know, their, their things have gone bad. Maybe not do their own fault, maybe so. But but you know, why does God hate me? I've had people ask me that question. And and that's the same question, right? How it how has he loved me? In what way has he loved me? How could you say he's loved me? Uh, we, we have this sort of narrow view of, of of things and and sometimes if our own lives are if things are as tidy as we might like, uh, we can we can really easily get frustrated and and wonder, right? Why does God hate me so why doesn't God love? Me? And and this is you know, this reminds us to look kind of at the bigger picture, the larger picture. How have how has God preserved uh, His people? How has God preserved us? How has He been with us? What has He done for us? How do we how do we how can we uh, not remember the good things that He's done and, and has given us? And so you know, I think that's kind of where. Where God, you know, takes Israel in this moment, you know. I don't think I love you well. Let's look around a little bit. I think we're going to see as we go through the book is I speak to a bitter people. They're yeah, bitter, they're self righteous, and that's why they're responding. And I mean, things are a mess, right? So you have verse six: a son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is your priests who show contempt for my name. So, you know, Israel's talking about, you know, why, why doesn't God love us? And God 
kind of easily turns the question back to Israel, right? Why don't you love me? Why, why, why don't you show me the honor that I'm due, especially who? the priests, especially the priests, who ought to, by right of their, uh, by right of their, that, the priests had a separate covenant with God. I mean, they were part of the covenant of Israel, but they had their own covenant with God, right? That, that they were going to be God's people in this unique way, even among the rest of Israel. And, uh, and, and by, in Malachi's time, uh, the priests have failed. They're, they're, the priesthood is corrupt. Another reason some think that Ezra is the writer of Malachi or that it's in the same time, because that was some of the what uh, seemingly Ezra dealt with as well. Um, there's this there's this failure among even the people who ought to be instructing Israel. We, we don't often think of the priests as instructing, but they did, they did some of that. They, they were supposed to be people who instructed in the covenant and instructed in the law. And uh, we have uh, Ezra and Nehemiah in their time, we have that, that responsibility. And actually the priesthood seems to have begun to absorb some extra responsibilities during the time of the return. So, you know, there's a greater expectation that the priests be representative of God and, and represent him to his people and honor him. And God says, You've shown contempt. And so here's the next question. How have we shown contempt for your name? You ask. God replies, by offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? So there's two questions for the price of one here, right? Uh, yeah. How have we shown contempt? And how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord all. I plead with God to be gracious with, to us. With such offerings from your hands, would he accept you, says the Lord all. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I'll accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as a sacrifice, I accept them for your, for, from your hands, says the Lord. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blem blemished animal to the Lord. For I'm a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Um, so what's the what's the... Contempt that Israel is showing. Why is that a problem? God doesn't, you know, why does God need the best animals? We sort of assume that, right? We we know that from the fact from the from our understanding of the law. Why? Why does God need the best animals? Because the animals are taking on our. Okay. Go ahead. What's that? that well, it, it would really be a sacrifice because okay. I mean, if you offer a diseased animal that's probably going to die anyway, um, you're not really giving up anything valuable. But if you give up, you know, a, a healthy, you know, good animal that you could use to, uh, you know. Increase your your herd. They have babies, or you know, um, then uh, you're you know you're giving up something valuable. So that's a really a that's a true sacrifice. Okay. <clears throat> Colette, what did you what were you gonna say? Well, you need something pure to take on the unpure. Okay. Yeah, the sacrifice. Like Diane is saying, you need. Um, something unblemished for to be able to take on our sacrifice. 
pick on our sins. I'm sorry. Okay. Other thoughts? It's an inter interesting thing to talk about, I think. Why does God, why does he expect the best? And I I, I, I think you're all hitting on right answers. Uh, but I, I do think, Diana, what you talked about, what seems to be the case here, it's easy to sacrifice an animal that you don't really want anyway, right? <laughs> that's like nothing. nothing to it. That, that, that's, that's a piece of cake. But to sacrifice something that matters to you, Right? To sacrifice something that's important that that will make a dent <laughs> by its absence. That shows respect for God. That shows above all you honor him. You want you want to honor him with your your gifts and your life. Um, and that's that's missing in Israel, right? This 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 idea of of, a, of an actual sacrifice. David somewhere, I can't remember exactly where it, it happens. I think it's, but David has this, says something to God uh, about, I, I, you know, I will not, ex I will not offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. I, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna take the easy way out. The threshing floor? I think it's the threshing floor. I, I was gonna say, I think it's at the threshing floor when there's the, the 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 uh, response of God to to the, the uh, and and David says you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take an easy way I'm not gonna take it offer a cheap sacrifice I'm gonna if I give a sacrifice it's gonna cost something it's gonna matter and and I think that's what God has always wanted right that 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 we give the best we can give and if if you know the the law itself allows right for gradations and sacrifice if you can't afford this you give this that's fine but give the best you can give all you can there is the first fruits right that yeah first fruits is is one we're, we're talking about giving the first fruits is one is one but it really any any time you offer an animal to god under the old law you offer one that is without blemish, right? That's the that's what you, you you hear all the time. Without blemish, that's the phrase in English Bibles that comes up pretty frequently, and and it, it's exactly what you say. You, you don't if one is born, you know, lame. You know, <laughs> sorry, you don't get to offer him to. Uh, if one's born blind or with birth defects or stillborn or what, you you don't you don't get to offer him to God. Uh, you, you offer something that matters. And so, they yeah. were sacrificing. Yeah. They were sacrificing their way, and not as God had commanded. Yeah. yeah. This idea carries over to our era. Not to give God the leftovers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think always, shouldn't it, that we, we should, we should do the best that we can do for God. We should offer Him the best we can offer, and, and. You know, I don't get to say what's best, you know, what's the best you can offer. I don't get to say that. That's that's something between you and God. But but we we should be people who are, I mean, God gave the best for us, right? We should be certainly able to, to give. Right, right, right. There's a practical dimension to it because the point is not to pay right. from the reasons for sacrifice in other religions, but it it's a bit it's a missive attitude, maybe a recognition that it all belongs to him anyway. Yeah, and, and just to show as he said, just to show uh, as he says here, just to show honor, right? Just to show uh, you know, my name will be great among the nations. That that comes up quite a bit in Malachi, right? That that God intends for His name not to just be. He doesn't intend to be provincial God, right? He intends to be the God of the nations, and 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 so uh, see His His covenant people <laughs> uh, failing in this fundamental way is to undermine His glory and what He is is due. Uh, and so he he expects that from his people. He says, uh, it's kind of a 
striking thing, right? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. I mean, they just rebuilt this temple, right? If, if it's if it's 450, like just the last 60 years, they've rebuilt. It, it's not been reopened very long. And God told them to rebuild it, right? It was, with Haggai and you know, God told them to, to rebuild these, this temple. And now through Malachi, he's saying, just might as well shut the doors. Might as well close it up based on sacrifices you're giving or the lack of. And then I think the worst thing you could say to anybody is, I am not pleased with you. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful temple, but it's empty. There's no spirituality in there. The priests are messing up. They're not doing their job. Yep. So that's what you got the situation here. Yeah, the there priests, and then it's filtering down to everybody else, right? The, the priests are, are dropping the ball, and it's filtering down to those who uh, who come to worship in the temple and, and, and come and bring sacrifices. Uh, and there's a warning to the priests then that begins chapter two. Uh, you priests, this warning is for you if you don't listen and if you don't resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I'll send a curse on you and I'll curse your blessings. Yes, I've already cursed them because you've not resolved to honor me. Uh, he talks about rebuking their descendants and... Uh, uh, verse three, I'll smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices and you'll be carried out. Yikes. I mean, that, you know, he's serious about this, right? <laughs> these, these sacrifices you've been offering, you know, I, 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 come here, I've got something to show you. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's just, you know, uh, he talks about the covenant with Levi, the covenant of life and peace. Uh, and this called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing was found false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. But the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he's the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you've turned from the way, and by your teaching you caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi says the Lord Almighty. So I've caused you to be despised, and humiliated before all the people because you've not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. I, I don't know exactly how God had humbled the priests uh, in the eyes of the people, but uh, maybe it's just their reputation wasn't so good anymore. They'd shown partiality. Guess what? If you show partiality in situations in which you have some uh, some sway, uh, People are going to notice and and it won't be too long before they don't trust you anymore. And so maybe that's really it. That they've undermined by their actions um, their trustworthiness among the people, the respect the people have for them. Um, I mean, whatever, however it's happened, they've they've lost the status that they had under Levi and that God intended. So yeah, I I, th I think all of this, you know, sacrifice. We offer the best. We give the best we can to God. And that doesn't mean we wear ourselves out and kill ourselves. And, and, and but it it does mean that we are willing to sacrifice for the Lord when it hurts and we're and when we're you know when 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 we can we 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 can we make sacrifices that matter to us. Sometimes it means giving up things in our lives that are important to us. Or other times it may mean uh, taking on things in our lives that we don't maybe even feel we have the energy for and the bandwidth for. Uh, but the idea that, that our lives are supposed to be worship, right? Our lives are supposed to be a living sacrifice uh, that we give to God um, that the best we can always. Think of uh, Paul telling the church in Colossae, you know, everything you do, <laughs> for the word, do it all for the, for the glory of God. Do it all. Do your best always for, for him. Whatever that may be, whatever it is that you're called to do, do it as you're working for the Lord and you give your best for him.
All right. Uh, why don't we go to verse 10? Uh, somebody read 10 through 16. So Malachi 2. Are, are we not all children of the same father? Are we not all created by the same God? Then why do we betray each other, violating the covenant of our ancestors? Judah has been unfaithful and detestable. Things have been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. The men of Judah had defiled the Lord's beloved sanctuary by marrying women who worship idols. May the Lord cut off from the nation of Israel every last man who has done this and yet brings an offering to the Lord of heaven, heaven the Lord of heaven's armies. Here is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning, because he pays no attention to your offering and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Go on. Through 16. 16, okay. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife and body and spirit are his? And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I will divorce, says the Lord, God of Israel. <coughs> to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wives. Okay, so uh, in some ways this is, is an extension of what we've talked about, bringing of unacceptable sacrifices, but what has made these <laughs> sacrifices unacceptable in, uh, in, my, in chapter two here? It's a little different, right? It's not the blemish sacrifices that are the problem. What's the problem? The men have women who worship idols. Very foreign uh, women who worship idols. Okay. And it also uh, also have they uh, divorced their wives marry others? Maybe. It seems to be the case, and it seems it seems you read Ezra uh, particularly in Nehemiah. It seems like sort of a an epidemic happening as 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 Israel has returned to the promised land. Um, they they there are for whatever reason, and and we don't know all the ins and outs of it, but for whatever reason, uh, there there have, have been a significant number of uh, Israelites divorcing their wives and marrying wives from foreign nations who, um, and and. Uh, Interestingly, of course, uh, what does Ezra tell him to do about that, by the way? Remember? Divorce? Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. <laughs> God doesn't like divorce, but <laughs> but Ezra says, you know what he doesn't like even more? What what you've been doing. And 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 Malachi agrees with that too. So so here's here's this this situation where people are, you know, they're coming to God's temple and they're bringing the, but they have broken faith with uh, what Malachi calls the wife of your youth, right? And 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 now you're marrying these other women and, and marrying outside the covenant, uh, outside the, the Lord's people uh, at a time, think about it, at a really tenuous time in your history, right? Where you're coming back to the promised land. Things, you know, things could change in a hurry. Things could go south quickly. And during this, Continuous time, you're undermining your identity as my people by marrying wives who are of Israel. Why they were doing this, we don't really know. Maybe, you know, 
tempted to sort of wonder if there's an economic motivation for it. Maybe, maybe some of these women are from families that are established in the land as they have returned. And, uh, and so there's this economic benefit to it. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, but, but for whatever reason, this is, this is going on and, and God is not pleased and says you, your worship has been undermined because you're you're breaking faith with one another in this. You're you're and and keep in mind, you know, if you were a woman in Malachi's time, what were your options? Generally speaking, for security, for a secure life. Marriage. What's that? Marriage. Marriage. Children who take care of you after your husband died, maybe. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of options. That's why the story of Ruth is so poignant, right? Uh, when Naomi widowed goes back to the promised land and Ruth goes with her, Ruth is kind of turning her back on, on going back home where there's people that know her and know her family and maybe she can start again, but she's going to this alien place where she's not known and not trusted. Uh, so, so, you know, there's this, uh, you don't have a lot of options if you're a woman in, in this situation at this time. And, and to have somebody break faith like this is devastating and, and destructive. Uh, not to mention, maybe they brought the wife from Babylon or wherever, you know, they were married and, and that's where perhaps her family even is. Maybe her family hasn't made the trip. Now what's she going to do? back in the promised land, cast adrift, you know, set loose. And, uh, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. And it's its cold and it's callous and it's indifferent and it is not keeping faith. And, and so God is, God, I you know, the testimony. Patrick, uh, yeah. the, pre the priests were um, supported. The, the people supported the priests. That's where um i guess their monies or livings or whatever come from the people mm -hmm. so it's it's like they allow the people to do whatever they wanted to do yeah maybe maybe so right maybe maybe there's some you know some <laughs> some uh, ulterior motives here the priests aren't instructing the people aren't telling the people what they need to hear and what they need to do because they're concerned about their own security uh, right Bottom line, they're not faithful to God and they're not faithful to one another either. Right, right. And that's something that has to have always been you know, faithful to one another. Yep. Stick together, like Jews, even today they do that. Yep. They stick together in communities and marriage for the most part. Yeah, they're but they're right. You're there there's you're exactly right. They are not they're not faithful to each other uh, any more than they're faithful to God. They're not faithful to any of their covenants. Right and and so yeah, it's it it is a mess, and people are hurt, and that's that's the issue, right? In verse sixteen, uh, there are actually a couple of different readings in verse sixteen. Uh, some people will read, uh, "I hate divorce." We'll, we'll understand it that way. The NIV now I noticed uh, says uh, has translated, "The man who hates and divorces his wife says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect." Uh, so it's it's in that case, it's the uh, uh, the man hating, and I believe it is a third person there. And uh, to get God to hates divorce, you have to sort of assume that there's uh, been a, uh, a a loss in the text along the way, which is possible also. But uh, but in any case, one way or the other, right? God doesn't. God, God hates this these these situations where people are damaged, people are injured, uh, just because you know there's not even. There's no there's no reason for this divorce other than they want to be married to somebody else, seeming. And 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 younger casting these people adrift, these these women adrift, uh, with no no support, no help. What what did you say, Linda? No, I was just saying maybe the um the women probably were younger, you know. Um maybe. yeah. Yeah. Maybe Young women. Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that, but I mean, that's that's sort of from in our day, that's often what happens, right? But I, I I don't 
I don't know for a fact that that was the reason, but uh, but for whatever, whatever the reasons were, the end result is these women who probably don't have a lot, especially if they're not young anymore, don't have a lot of options perhaps for yeah. you know another husband, uh, and and so they're they're at a loss. Marriage is presented in Genesis to go before God to complete this mystical thing that we don't entirely understand. So, really, it should be up to Him for that to be broken. Obviously, they didn't go before Him for that. But. I mean, we know what Jesus says, right, about about divorce and about the the the. Well, just, you know, what what is intended? What God intends, right? That. That that when what God has joined together, Jesus uh, says, man shouldn't separate, people shouldn't separate. Um, yeah, I, you're right. I don't know how that union happens exactly, and in what way God is involved. But Jesus seemed to think he was involved in some way, right? And and that uh, that certainly you when you make that covenant, you make it before God, and you make it with Him included, and it's not to be broken lightly. Jesus in some very specific <laughs> situations. In fact, we're uh, we're only in Hebrew. I, I I don't think this text ought to be pressed to to say you know that you know uh, if you know if you've been divorced, God hates you. I, I don't I don't think that's what Malachi is getting at. There's a very specific set of situations here in Malachi, but it does remind us right of the covenant we make in marriage and other covenants we make with each other. Other uh, you know, other ways in which we can be unfaithful to one another and the damage that can cause and, and what that can do in a, in, a, in a society and in a world. And we see that in our world. We see the loss of covenant and the, the, the breaking of these, these bonds and these trusts that, uh, that need to be held sacred. And we see what happens. And it is all through the society. It's between the priests and the people, right? They don't trust the priests anymore. Between husbands and wives, it's between people and God. There's this just continual breaking of code. Well, let's look at 17 before we get too far behind here. You've worried the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he's pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? Uh, so how have they wearied him? What has been the, what has just worn God out? What, 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 what words have just worn God out? It's Habakkuk, right? Where's God? Where, you know, where is this, this God of justice who, who's going to make things right for us? Uh, now they've been able to go back to the promised land, but we see from Ezra and Nehemiah that that, didn't mean their troubles were over, right? There were still a lot of struggles and a lot of threats, existential threats. And and so there, you know, there's still this, where are you, God? Where are you to, we have the Psalms, right? Where you, you know, you were raining down fire on your enemies and breaking the teeth out of their mouths. And where where is this God of justice that we keep hearing about? God says, you're just wearing me out with this stuff. You're just wearing me out. Uh, but he answers them, right? His answer is verse, starting in verse 1. I'll send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you're seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Have you seen that verse before? I'll send my messenger. I'm talking about Jesus, right? Uh, it's actually it's just applied to who? John the Baptist, right? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll send my messenger who will prepare the way, and then the Lord will come to his temple. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so so John the Baptist is the one who's often spoken of as this messenger that, that the people were expecting. Uh, remember that after Malachi, we don't have much... If any, we don't really have anything uh, that we know of in the way of prophecy until John comes hundred years later. So, so there's this 
long silence. And, you know, the last thing God is going to say, we'll see. Uh, but it's about this messenger. And, uh, and then John comes. So it's easy to, to sort of see the, the connection, probably, if you're looking for it. But, you know, so this messenger you're seeking is good. Messenger of the covenant. In other words, the one who's going to come to reaffirm this covenant, reaffirm that you're the Lord's people. They're going to come. This messenger is going to come. But what's the problem? Verse 2 and 3, 4. Somebody read that. 2, 3, and 4. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he'll be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He'll sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He'll purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. And I'll keep reading. So I'll come to put you on trial. I'll be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, deprive the foreigners among you of justice. Do not fear me, says the Lord. So it's kind of like Amos, right? Talking about wanting justice. It's coming, but you might not like it. You might not like it when it gets here. Because I'm not, not only going to testify against those you regard as your enemies, I'm going to testify against you and against the practices that you've been involved in. I'm going to be a refiner's fire. I'm going to be a launderer's soap. I'm going to refine you and clean you up and uh, make you accept and uh, put on trial those who do all these things. Look at the, you know, look at the list, right? There were some some heavy stuff going on <laughs> as Israel returned to the promised land. Sorcerers. So there's uh, a cult, there's idol, you know, idol rituals, uh, 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 adulterers. We've already looked at that some. Perjurers, those lying in legal settings and those letting the lying happening happen, knowing it's, that it's happening. Uh, there's those who are defrauding laborers of their wages, who are oppressing widows and the fatherless and depriving the foreigners of justice. So all these things that, this, none of this is any surprise, right? Uh, the law has always said, these things God does not look kindly upon. So it's no surprise when it's happening. We always have that tendency to think, you know, God's going to come and you know, I want God to come and smite my enemies we god's people have always liked the idea of god smiting our enemies right uh but uh what we don't always take into account is uh, what james talks about it's time for judgment to start with the house of god right sometimes sometimes we need to look more closely at ourselves and, and look at our own lives and our own practices and our own assumptions and prejudices and uh and let god deal with that first I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Uh, ever since the time of the ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. This is the covenant. I don't change. I made the covenant. I made the promises, and I don't change. And that's why you're not like, remember Edom, chapter one? That's why you're not like them. That's why you haven't been destroyed. Not because you're so great but because I don't change. I keep my promises. I keep my word. And I have continued to preserve you. And even now, if you return to me, I'll return to you. Isn't it interesting? It hasn't been that long, right? There's been 70 years of captivity. They've finally been able to go back to the promised land. And it's within a generation or two. I mean, it has all just come off the rails. We've seen, we saw it with, with Haggai, who's, you know, maybe a generation has come, built their houses, and everybody's living in comfort and peace. And uh, Haggai says, isn't it time <laughs> that you start thinking about the temple? Uh, it doesn't take long sometimes for us to, the, I, I can remember the preacher, I was a 
young guys often uh, were one generation away from apostasy. Uh, what they thought of as apostasy is maybe a little uh, different than what I think of as, as apostasy, but uh, but they're not wrong, right? <laughs> you know, they're, 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 it doesn't take long sometimes to lose your bearings, to forget who you belong to, and that seems what seems to be what's happened uh, in God's time. So return to me, and I'll return to you. But you ask, how are we to return? Verse 8, then, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I believe that might be the first and only place in the Bible where God says, test me. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. If you come up with it another time. But God actually says, try me. Just try. Me. See what happens. If you will give the tithe, the tenth of your, uh, the tenth of, of all that you, uh, you, you have, uh, if you'll give that tenth, like I've asked, just see what happens. He promises that I'll, I'll keep it for you and I'll, I'll, pour out so much blessing there won't be room enough to store it 12 all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land yeah, and that's that's you know one thing that we should consider i think as we think of sacrifice and giving and and, and whether it's money or time or effort or, or whatever it is uh we don't serve a God who just takes, right? <laughs> we serve a God who gives as well. A God who is generous. So I don't think we have a lot to fear as we give to God. Uh, verse 13. You, uh, uh, verse, yeah, 13. you have spoken arrogantly against me. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You've said it's futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his commandments and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Uh, maybe that's the heart of the problem, right? People have become cynical. They have seen uh, folks that they regard as evil, blessed. They've seen, um, you know, they've been through a lot. They come back and guess who's living on their land? All these foreigners who worship other gods, living in their places and, and living on their land and and, uh, and making life difficult for them. And, and they're wondering, what are we getting for serving God? Look at where it's gotten us. Again, a little bit of a limited view, right? They're they're forgetting a few things, but 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 that's sort of their point of view. Why don't we get for serving God? Seems like they've lost all sensitivity. Yeah. Well, in this case, yeah. In this case, in this case, God doesn't respond specifically right away. First, uh, verse sixteen. There, there's a group of those who fear the Lord. So there is. As always in the prophets, there's a remnant, right? There's some folks who still fear God. And they get together and they talk. And the Lord listened and heard. I like that idea just that, you know, when people who fear the Lord get together and talk. And, and you know, God hears that. Things happen. And, and it matters. It makes a difference. And in this case, uh, what happens is these, these folks decide to... Well, it's actually, it seems like, uh, as they mentioned, a scroll of remembrance was written in God's presence concerning those who fear the Lord and honor his name. You could take it a couple of ways. Uh, it's almost, you could say, well, these, these folks got together who fear the Lord and they wrote some sort of statement or decree that they were going to serve God or whatever. Um, I think it might be, though, that uh, God listened and God heard, and 
in God's presence, there's a, a scroll to remind him. Not that God needs reminding, but but you get the idea, right? There's this picture, this 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 figure of speech of God's made notes, or He's had somebody make notes for Him. You know, the angels maybe they've they've made the notes. And they they and God knows. God knows who these people are who fear Him, and and so He responds in verse seventeen: On the day when I act, this people and this scroll of remembrance, they will be my treasured possession. I'll spare them, just as the Father has compassion and spares his son. And you'll again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you'll go out and frolic like well-fed calves. I like that. Then you'll trample on the wicked, and there'll be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. So God responds, right? Does, doesn't do any good to serve the Lord. He's coming, right? He's coming. He'll burn like a fire for those who are evildoers, for those who don't serve God, for those who try to hurt his people and oppress, oppress the weak. And, uh, it, it's coming. But you bear my name. I love that picture of the sun coming up, right? It's, it's sunrise. And there's healing and there's hope and there's promise. Uh, a lot of Christians through the centuries have taken that as message. Certainly see why, right? Uh, the sunrise of the healing of the kids. Um, the point is, God is going to act, and when He does, He'll He'll bring this all. He'll, he'll bring things, make things right, and uh, and and that's you know that's that's our hope as 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 Christians that we we don't we don't get too worn down when we're treated unjustly. And, in this world, in this life, because we believe in a God who sets things right. And, and that's what we keep our faith on and keep our eyes focused on, that God sets things right. And we do what we can in our world to, to help him do that and to be a part of that. But in the end, what we trust is that the son of righteousness is going to rise. Verse 19. So, two more verses, three more verses. Verse four, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all his. So that's interesting. God, at the end of all this, he says, remember the law. Remember what I told Moses all those years ago. It hasn't changed. <laughs> and and remember that. Just keep that in your mind. Keep that in your mind and live by that, that law. In the end, it's back to square one, right? It's back to what God always intended. Just be my people. And then verse five. See, I'll send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He'll turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I'll strike the land with total destruction. Uh, of course, Elijah... Uh, is John the Baptist is called Elijah, and uh, Jesus calls him Elijah, and and points to uh, to Malachi's uh, prophecy that uh, Elijah is going to come. He's going to turn the the hearts of the people, and uh, and instead of that judgment and that fire that God is talking about, there'll be this righteousness. There'll be this hope, and uh, so John came and did the turning and prepared the way, and Christ came to to be that son of righteousness. Um, so. I, uh, I, I, it's 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 fascinating to me. Mal Malachi ends with 
you know, Elijah, John the Baptist, and then the New Testament begins, and we get real quickly to Elijah and to John the Baptist, and it's very clear uh, what uh, the New Testament, what the gospel writers particularly were doing with Malachi. You know, there's, there's been this silence that ended with that that hope hanging out there, right? That, that one day he was going to send Elijah, and and the writers of all the gospels say he did. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, does that mean when Elijah come that is giving people um, a second chance to to you know to change or grace? It's God's grace. It's it's instead of this judgment I just described. You know, before this judgment that I just described, I'm going to send Elijah. And he'll come and and hopefully turn the hearts of the people, and 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 um, that's that's kind of what you know, John came right with the baptism of repentance, preparing the way for Jesus for the Lord to come and and, uh, and offer salvation in the kingdom of God. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's well, then you get a, another opportunity to to, to change, right? Yeah. Or Okay, I got it. Yeah, I mean, uh, God could say, this is my last word. <laughs> this is not what's going to happen. What he says at the end of Malachi is, there's another prophet coming. And he'll turn the people. And mm -hmm. that's what I want. That's what I intend. I, I really want to be giving, giving Israel, giving his people and through that, all people a chance for the new redemption. Um, I like to, kind of sad, but uh, the Jewish people today still leave an empty seat uh, at the Passover for Elijah. Kind of sad and kind of. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you and good night. All right, everybody. Colette, you have a great trip. We get you our prayers. Okay. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.